Hi there. So I was saying that this is our third class of the series. This one is what some consider to be the least, if not least, but not as paramount as diet. And if you were on last week, you know what we're talking about, and that's whole food plant predominant or plant exclusive. And the week before that was setting purpose, which gives the foundation to everything. And then of course, movement, which we can't do without on a daily basis. We're anatomically and evolutionarily dependent on that. Um, but these pillars are the, these, these subjects, which are sleep, stress management, and then community can be easily not prioritized. In other words, can be put to the side and you're going to hear today why that's not such a good idea. Um, it has a lot to do with who we are uh, as people because it affects us from our cognition all the way to our mood and temperament. And that has a lot to do with who we are. So I will be beginning with a PowerPoint. And when I'm doing the PowerPoint, I'm going to, let me just do something, hold on. There we go. I'm gonna get a mute all going. I finally am learning how to do these things. I'm used to this for going on five years now running groups. But when you're running groups, everyone's talking and it, I was gonna say it's a free for all, it's never a free for all, but it's, it's just different than doing this. Okay, um, so I'm going to do a PowerPoint. That'll probably be about an hour. It could be an hour and 15 minutes. Then we have questions and answers by end earlier than it's questions and answers then. And um, so jot down anything you wanna know. You also will find this tomorrow in the um, my YouTube, on my YouTube channel, which is simple, Nan Simonson forward slash YouTube. And there are recipes and there is this and um, uh, another program that I did that was similar on the um, pillars of lifestyle. And I'll talk about that to show you a um, slide on that, just to remind you at the very end. So let's get going. What you'll find is that I am, I'm gonna take a minute to look at the chat just because hello from South Beach and oh Angela it's you hello and if, if you guys haven't looked at Angela's channel and Angela in general she's this kick rear end physical person for 30 years she's been teaching um, wellness through movement and she's she's um, quite capable and Dina and sorry I did not realize I was off mute oh, okay it's it's all right and Michelle, hi, Michelle. Michelle is part of a program that I am deeply now entrenched in, and that is a, a um, physical movement program with Eileen Kopsoftis, K-O-P-O-F, Kopsoft, off, <laughs> T-I-S. Um, and she is, you can find her, online. You can find her on YouTube. She's brilliant in keeping us moving our bodies in safe ways and to relieve pain. As we get older, it's not just about movement for muscles. It's not just about for bone strength and muscle strength. It's also for keeping ourselves moving well, because you notice it's okay. Quick aside, Tim was asked by some you know what? I'm not going to say this because if they see this, they'll feel sad. Bottom line, people in their 50s and 60s begin that shuffle, that old person shuffle, because they're not walking, moving smoothly. And we can be 100 and never have that shuffle if we move our bodies well. Okay. And I think that's all I'm going to say because I'm going to... So what The reason I brought up the chat is that I can't pay attention to the PowerPoint and be talking and then try to read as well. I'm, I just can't do that. If you've ever watched Chef AJ, she can do three things at once and read lightning fast and I don't do any of that. So I'm going to go ahead and start with my PowerPoint and um, be jotting down notes because 
Um, there are a couple of things. You can put things in the chat that I do see afterwards, and that's helpful. If you have a thing you want to say or a thing you need a response to, give me enough information because I read it afterwards after we've, we've disengaged, and um, I will act on that, if not immediately, because quite often I have something else I go right to. I will. Um, okay, screen share. Here we go. All right. And I don't even have the visuals up that I can see us or even me when I'm talking uh, because it takes up screen room and then I can't tell what I'm looking at. So we're going to let that go. Okay, so as we discussed last week, lifestyle medicine is a, uh, a part of a certification that doctors can um, can adopt, which leads them away from the allopathic model, which is I have a few minutes with you, you tell me what's wrong, and I'm going to prescribe a pill or a procedure. In most cases, when have you had a traditional doctor ask you about these modalities? If you check into a lifestyle medicine certified physician, He's going to ask you about this. As a matter of fact, the doctor that I'm a health coach with going on five years now, Dr. Wayne Dysinger, who was a founding member and past president of the College of Lifestyle Medicine, gives every patient a clipboard that has these on it that they respond to uh, uh, on a scale of one to 10. Where are you? How are you? How is your life? In other words, it has everything to do with how they are physically. That was me with a great smile on my face because that photo was taken in December of 2018. I had been introduced to, let's say, food as medicine back at the end of August through the Wellness Forum, some class I picked up at a botanic garden, three and a half hour class. They fed us a meal. And at that class, it was called um, Food as Medicine. I learned, and I was always interested in food as health. And I learned about whole food, plant-based, and what it means to us physically. Loved it, got certified with um, Pam Popper, Dr. Pam Popper, as a food as medicine uh, teacher. But I had been, at this time, with that great smile on my face, introduced to Lifestyle Medical, the clinic that is so near my home run by Dr. Dysinger. And when I went to a class there on food for, um, or on a, a cooking class, a plant-based cooking class and asked, oh, you're not a patient. How did you hear about us? I told them and they said, and I said, I'm learning because I'm about to become a health coach and this is what I'm going to train on. They said, oh, we need a health coach. That was that month. <laughs> I went out and got a picture because they said, we need a picture of you because they said, you can be our new health coach. And that's how the thing started because their health coach was leaving again, December of 2018. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, this is what we've consolidated. Oh, let me go back. So again, um, healthful eating, predominantly plant-based, physical activity daily, stress management on a number of levels, um, focusing on and maintaining relationships, that's connectedness, sleep, the importance of that, and substance, um, staying away from risky substances. At our clinic, we broke, broke it down into four, and those four are the well, yes, daily movement, but under relaxation, we have sleep and stress management. And under nutrition, we have food and staying away from risky substances, such as overuse of, well, no use of tobacco, overuse of caffeine, um, either no or a gentle use, if that is something that somebody does of alcohol, um, and then connectedness. Being part of a something and a someone makes a huge difference with our wellness. I can't talk about my past without talking about how difficult it was for decades, five decades precisely, <laughs> to live with an eating disorder. I dealt with life 
through food, binging and unfortunately purging. And it was when I began, this is not just a coincidence, and I write about this, when I began whole food plant-based lifestyle and understanding food as medicine, I was able to stop that. I think it was because, I know it was because it helped balance my body. There was a little more to it than that. And I write about that, but that's not why I wrote this book. That acronym, Powerfully, which is an acronym for 10 lifestyle modalities, is what I wrote two years after beginning as a coach with lifestyle medicine, because it was a year and a half I began writing it. It was published two years after I began because of what I had seen and what I had learned as a health coach. And with this promise, find vibrant health, balance, and joy, I feel secure in saying that with lifestyle as medicine, as we discuss here. So the impact of lifestyle on medicine, Hippocrates had a lot to say that we pay attention to. And one of them is the natural healing force within each of us is the greatest force in getting well, but we have to get out of its way. And that's why lifestyle medicine is the use of evidence-based lifestyle therapeutic approaches such as plant predominant, dietary lifestyle, regular physical activity, adequate sleep, stress management, avoiding risky substances, and this is what I talked about and in terms of the difference between an allopathic model and pursuing other non-drug modalities to treat, reverse, and prevent disease. Do they not prescribe? Well, sure they prescribe. If we have a diabetic, a brittle diabetic, if we have someone with cardiovascular problems, we will prescribe. But first, we're going to pay attention to what's going on in their life. Otherwise, these people are prescribed something that they will be on the rest of their lives. This is the way it looks when we're talking about, as we call it, resilience, which is sleep and stress management. At least seven to eight hours of sleep. Yes, some people can get on with six and a half hours. Some people sleep nine. But what we're looking at is waking up naturally without an alarm and feeling refreshed. If you can do that, then that pretty well tells you where you are in terms of your own bio-individuality and sleep. Stress management, we're going to talk about different modalities today. And rest and renewal, putting us into a our parasympathetic system into such a framework on a daily, weekly, annual. Annual means when you take off on a holiday, but a lot of us find time to take holidays on a more regular basis. We're in a state that we're not in constant fight or flight, which can be daily lives in our very, very busy, uh, busy society. I can't talk about sleep or any of these things without talking about the circadian rhythm. This is if there's anything you garner from this today, it's an understanding of the circadian rhythm. What is the circadian rhythm or clock? It's a cycle of physical, mental, and behavioral changes that our body goes through every 24 hours, mostly affected by light and darkness and controlled by a very small area in our brain. So, Every animal, every mammal, and most living things live by a circadian rhythm. The problem is humans get in our own way. Most other animals, most other mammals don't. If you look at this clock, the top is six in the morning, the bottom is six at night. We're looking at the 12 hours that way. This is, for some people, considered an ideal circadian clock, meaning that we're up with the sun. Now, this is in general. If you're way far north, if you're in the Scandinavian countries, if you're in the, the, um, on the equator, for example, things are going to be different. But in general, if our circadian clock jumps into action with light, one of the wisest things we could do is get up when the sun comes up in general 
and get bright light in our eyes outside. Those photons, now I was up this morning, it was 40 degrees, it was raining, and I did what I do every morning, just get up and go, because for an hour, I'm either gonna be cycling or running, walking, you know, run slash walk, going up my mountain near us that I just adore, and I was up there this morning. There were clouds everywhere because it was raining, and yet I still pulled out my um, oh, it's a it's an app, light meter. It's called light meter, and it's free. And put it up in the sky, and it was still what was it, eighteen thousand lux. In other words, that was bright light, even though it was behind the clouds. What that does is that says to my pineal gland, okay. It's daylight, now set your timer for 12 to 16 hours, more like 13 or 14, to start that melatonin, putting us into a sleep state. That's what happens when we get bright light in our eye. The circadian rhythm is in general set up the way you can see it around the clock. Our stress hormone, meaning cortisol and some others, start to rise in the morning and that kind of gets you energized. We're at our high alertness, usually a few hours after that, four or five hours after that. What does it mean by feed eight to 12 hours? My guess is a number of you, if not all of you, are familiar with the attention that's being paid on the um, what they call either time-restricted feeding or um, intermittent fasting. I think the most popular term for it now is time-restricted feeding or time-restricted eating. I have been practicing this now for four years, and I just don't even think about it. It's actually a great discipline. It's It has been researched and shown to be fabulous for our brain, our hormonal clock, our organs, our body to know what we're doing, when we're doing it, and to give us rest during the non-feeding time for our, I'm just going to say a general body clean out. There's so many words and so many concepts and so many hormones and so much that goes on with that. It's, it's, it could be many, many classes. In any case, for example, when I look at this circadian rhythm, I begin eating at 8.30 because I exercise what, what they call fasted. At 8.30, I have my breakfast or eight and I finish by 8.30. Don't eat again. Oh, I don't mean that. I have lunch, but don't eat for four to five hours. That gives my, some, write this down, the migrating motor complex. A lot of people eat all day long. We've been told by some people, unless again, you're diabetic and you don't have control of your insulins or you must do this. Some people think that we need to eat all day long. It's actually healthy for your body to let that migrating motor complex that happens about three to four hours after you eat and picture a rotor rooter job going through a tube. It's kind of like that. It's this peristalsis that kind of moves things along. Okay, get ready for your next meal. All of these things become very habitual in, in at, to a cellular level when we are living by our biological rhythm. In any case, don't eat again until usually 12.30 or one o'clock and then eat again at 5.30 the goal is to be finished by 6 or 6.30. Then nothing until that next morning. That is a, for me, it's a 10-hour feeding window and a 14-hour fasting window. Now, if you think of, and I don't know your patterns, but if I think of that as it used to be, I snacked all the time because I thought we were supposed to. I thought it was healthier that way. We would have dinner and then sit around watching TV and think, well, you got to have something to eat in the evening to entertain yourself while you're watching TV. None of that is my life anymore. But that is the way a lot of people live. And so we're never letting our body rest and digest. We're also 
not allowing something I'm going to recommend a little later in terms of the best span before you go to bed to stop eating at. But let's keep going with the circadian rhythm. So what happens is you get light in your eyes. Your pineal gland says, okay, I'm going to start releasing melatonin you know, 12, 13, 14 hours later. And your, your most energetic, your high alertness is a few hours after that. Your muscle performance peaks by three, four o'clock. You've got the sun going down at certain times of the year around this time. When it starts to get dark, this is about eight o'clock where the melatonin begins to rise, especially if you've got sun in your eye early. Your body by nature wants to cool down one to three degrees. That also tells it get ready to start closing down processes, getting ready for rejuvenation, 12 to 16 hours of rejuvenation. That's what I look at as that time you're not feeding, but you're letting your body do a, call it general clean out. One of the, the, the most spoken of recommendations, and I'm going to give the name of somebody a little later when you can actually see it in writing, that I hear constantly is the value of having a consistent sleep and wake time because your body will get used to that. And what the value of having a 10 or 11 o'clock sleep time, it could be earlier, but not later because at around that time, there are certain processes that go on in your brain that if you go to bed beyond them, don't repeat. In other words, there are sleep cycles that begin at about 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, just, it, it, I'm going to call it light regulated, that if you go to bed much later, let's say you have one of those one-off times that you go to bed at midnight, you've missed that window and your body is not going to go back and capture what happens earlier. What happens earlier in your sleep cycle? The generation of stem cells, your IGF-1 rises, your insulin-like growth factor that's good for your brain. It doesn't mean that you're going to be deficient long-term by missing it once in a while, but some people miss it all the time by having an inconsistent sleep time, but also by not getting enough sleep on a regular basis. You've got your cycles of sleep. We'll talk about that in a minute. Body temperature rises just before you wake up. And this is the circadian clock. What does it look like written out? If you're gonna honor your clock, your feeding window is eight to 12 hours. There is a gentleman, Walter Longo, Dr. Walter Longo, scientist who has studied the circadian clock as it relates to eating and fasting and health. He studied this for 25 years and came out with the, um, the oh shoot. What is the, uh, oh, the fasting, I'm thinking of his program, Fasting Mimicking. Um, I'll think about it in a minute. But anyway, Dr. Walter Longo. Uh, hit the ground running with his book that came out two years ago after 25 years of research on the value of, oh, the no, still can't think of it, on fasting. In any case, he recommends and says that everybody, unless they're very, very old and sick or they're pregnant um, or they're young children, should be having a 12-hour fasting window, which means a 12 hour eating window. He says that's ideal, but a little longer is great as well if somebody can do it. So we have our feeding time, a regenerative time. We have our sleep time in that regenerative period. We move every day, planned exercise as well as daily movement. We seek sunlight first thing in the morning. And remember the the um, the app I mentioned, um, Gosh, now I can't think of what that is either because I'm kind of thinking ahead. Um, oh, light meter. If you want to look at what we're talking about here Luxwise, and you want to control evening light. And this is something that a lot of people don't think about as well. And it's called sleep hygiene. 
well, let me first tell you about these resources that you can take this video back to in case you can't write this down fast enough and you probably won't be able to. But remember, this will be on YouTube as of tomorrow. And Dr. Sachin Panda has a seminal book on the circadian rhythm called the circadian code. But you can, in many cases, you can simply put these people into YouTube and come up with some great talks of theirs. Dr. Andrew Huberman is someone I, 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 I highly respect and admire, even though he takes no stand on dietary and I'm gonna say lifestyle, at least not in the way I wish he did. I worry about him. He's in his late forties and I think I don't like the way you're eating. He's a omnivore, father was, um, Argentinian, and so steak is in his vernacular, but we'll leave that alone. He's a brilliant scientist. He's a professor of neurobiology and ophthalmology at Stanford. He has the Huberman lab there, and he is a avid YouTuber. I think he has, gosh, is he up to a million yet or more? Um, but watch this video. You'll get a lot out of this one, one and a half hour video that. Um, I was just listening to, I listen to him almost on a daily basis when I'm up the mountain, because usually his talks are quite long. Master your sleep and be more alert when awake. Uh, Dr. Huberman, master your sleep and be more alert when you're awake. He has a free yoga nidra script. He recommends yoga nidra constantly because he has also coined a phrase, N-S-D-R, non-sleep deep. I'm sorry, non-sleep deep rest um, that allows our brain to kind of have a washout even midstream in the middle of a day. And there are resources such as Yoga Nidra, and he has the free script for that on that particular podcast. But he also recommends some others like the Headspace app, which is for meditation, and the free Reverie app, which is for self hypnosis it's a self-hypnosis app it's hard and this is a quote of his that you'll hear again and again if you listen to him it's hard to control the, the the mind with the mind so use your body to do that and that's where these other modalities uh come in sleeping well wouldn't you love to be able to sleep this easily <laughs> uh when we want to get ourselves into a certain rhythm. There are physical things that we need to do. Have a comfortable bed, have a quiet space, have a preferably dark space. Um, use our bedrooms primarily for sleep. And I've heard many doctors say this, use your bedroom for sleep and sex, not entertainment, not TV, not um, uh, hyperactive game playing because you can get into a rhythm again sleep hygiene where you know when I go to bed it is time to turn off and that becomes part of our physiology good nightly um, hygiene in other words sleep hygiene is a thing just like personal hygiene brushing your teeth flossing doing things on a regular basis can make a big impact on how comfortable you are with falling into sleep, staying asleep, and getting a restorative sleep. Consistent sleep and wake times is recommended across the board by from neurologists. 6.5 to 9 hours is best, but again, you can sort of test yourself, see when you go to sleep on a regular basis, when you wake up refreshed without an alarm clock pretty well tells you what your body likes no food two to three hours before bedtime this is for your physiological health it's not healthy to lay down with a stomach full of food that can then migrate up into the esophagus but just as important if you go to bed when your stomach is not so actively digesting it gives your body time to, and the 
the free resources to start doing that um, cleaning out of uh, body processes beyond even the migrating motor complex. Dim the lights all over your house one to two hours before bedtime, no bright overheads. As Dr. Huberman says, at the lower part of our retina, we perceive the bright light. That makes sense because you're looking up to the sun when you wake up to set your circadian clock. Well, for that reason, it's best to have lower lights. I have counter lights all over and some low stand lights. I keep them, I keep the lower bulbs. I have small bulbs at a number of these places. And throughout the house, if you come to our house, it's there's relatively dim light, of course, unless we're entertaining, um, in all the rooms so that a bright light doesn't stop the production of melatonin because that's exactly what happens. Reduce or eliminate caffeine and alcohol late in the day. And if they keep you awake, I have found I can have, I do a half calf every morning, um, too much caffeine and I'm jittery, not enough. And I kind of miss that little bit of a, ooh, <laughs> that coffee gives you. So I have a cup of half calf every morning. But if I have a caffeinated drink, at noon, but especially after that, I'll wake up, I'll fall asleep, but I'll wake up in the middle of the night. And it's consistently when I've done that, even a big uh, a glass of iced tea, if I'm having lunch somewhere and didn't bring my own, I usually bring my own um, herb tea in a carafe with me, uh, filtered water and all of that reverse osmosis. Um, you know that we've been told if you're a woman that there is no safe level that has been established for the prevention of breast cancer. It's just not good to be throwing alcohol into our body. And unfortunately, society kind of tells us that that's the way to have fun. Um, it's not so. Cool and dark room, 66 to 68 degrees is best. It helps your body lower that temperature and keep it low. Uh, just an aside, Tim wakes up at 4.30. He goes out, he's at by five. He gets into the sauna, but the um, infrared sauna that we have, it's near and far infrared. He has to heat it a little. But by the time he goes out, it's still dark. But he turns on the heater when he leaves. And I just thought to myself this morning, I've got to tell him not to do that because it wakes me up. My body starts warming up and it wakes me up before I want to get up, which is at six o'clock. Um, anyway, don't overstimulate your senses before you go to bed in any way, not with TV shows, not with bright light from, um, from uh, visual screens. Chamomile tea has a thing in it called apigenin, and it does relax your muscles and helps you sleep. So mom was right when she said, oh, I'm going to make you a chamomile. I can still remember those flowers floating in the tea that my mom used to give me in the, in the um, evening. I think that's interesting. Meditation, yoga nidra, nidra guided meditation. In other words, get your mind quiet. And then first thing in the morning, bright outdoor light or through a window, through a closed window, it's going to, you can do it, but it's going to take you twice as long. Two to 10 minutes of bright light can be enough, but through a window, it's going to take you much longer. Through sunglasses, it's going to take you much longer. So just go out there. Don't stare at the sun. Anything that hurts the retina, that makes you want to close your eyes. Bright light, bright blue light, by the way, is a good thing in the morning, but it's best if you get the photons from the sun. And don't wear blue light blockers during the day. At night, they're fine, but you want all the blue light you can get in the day until you start getting ready to um, close it all down for the evening. The effects of sleep. Why are we making such a big deal about this? You're familiar with the lymphatic system. Your lymphatic system is pumped by muscle movement. That's one reason you must move during the day. Well, you have a glymphatic system. That's the glymph in your brain, that the lymphatic system in your brain that cleans out. And these are very simple, unscientific words that Again, these are entire classes on these things that cleans out the debris and dead cells called autophagy, cleaning them out in the brain. And there's so much more that happens at night 
And without sleep, these things don't happen. Um, I was just listening to Dr. Greger who explained this, more fat than muscle is lost if you get adequate sleep and fewer calories. In other words, if you're eating fewer calories, you're trying to lose weight. If you are not sleep deprived, you will burn up fat. If you are sleep deprived, they have shown that you'll burn up more muscle than fat. In other words, sleep deprivation is a bad thing. If you weren't even cutting calories, in other words, sleep deprivation is going to be more advantageous. Um, I mean, sleep deprivation is going to cause the accumulation of fat. I think his article was something like, does cutting out sleep make you fatter? And that was his way of saying yes. Anticipatory circuits loved this. Dr. Huberman was talking about anticipatory circuits. Your body is used to whatever you've been doing with it, waking up whenever, going to sleep willy nilly. But he said in as little as three to five days, anticipatory circuits in your body will get used to a rhythm that you set up. So you can reestablish these rhythms. The first thing in the morning rhythm, the the um, sleep hygiene rhythm, your body will start anticipating it. And with that anticipation, it builds an arousal, a, 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 a I'm not say a requirement, but a anticipation of that, that expected activity, which makes it easier to want to do it again and again and again. The dreams in the first part of the night builds growth hormone, motor skills, neural circuits, and repairs damaged tissue. REM sleep in the latter part of the night, even though we go through cycles of, well, I'm not even going to get into the cycles. I'll just say in general, first part of the night, second part of the night, even though we cycle with these things all night long. REM sleep in the latter part of the night sorts information, creates new knowledge, and is crucial for learning. And this is put in a nutshell. Study something during the day. It can be Spanish. It can be some hard math problem because you're in school. Can't get it, can't get it, can't get it. That's me and, and this IT stuff. <laughs> I have the worst time understanding things that are in, in technology. Then you go to bed with that. If you're getting your REM sleep, these things are going to be sorted out. The junk will go, the, the, the peripheral things that don't matter will fade away, but conclusions and learning takes place during your REM sleep that the next day leaves you in a situation where sometimes, and you can think about times this happens where you suddenly come up with an answer. That's the value of your sleep and getting enough of it and making sure you get your REM sleep, not interrupted sleep. If sleep is, and this is something that was that was said by a doctor, Gina Poe, who Dr. Huberman was interviewing, who is a internationally or is internationally established as an expert on sleep and our um, our our um, uh, attitude, our our let's say personality. I'm saying it wrong, but in general, that's what it is. If sleep is restricted. It affects the brain, the hormones, the microbiome, and increases risk for disease. Our body will simply perform suboptimally. She also went on to say there is nothing that can substitute for sleep. Okay. Foods that contain melatonin. Rather than taking melatonin because that can set you up to need melatonin, Eat the foods that make a difference. And no, you're not going to be eating them right before bedtime, but you can make these as the latter end of the day meals or your dinner before you go into your fast. Walnuts and pistachios, and these foods actually have mel melatonin. Um, walnuts and pistachios, tart cherries, whole grains like wheat, bar be come on, man, wheat, barley, and oats. <laughs> Grapes and strawberries, tomatoes, bell peppers, and mushrooms. There are Sleep promoting foods like kale because of its calcium helps make tryptophan. Chamomile, we talked about the apigenin. Lettuce, because it has an element that also relaxes the muscles. Lactocarium, 
almonds, tryptophan and magnesium, sweet potatoes, sleep promoting complex carbohydrates. And even Dr. Huberman, who loves his meat, says, I do the meat in the daytime, but I stick with the complex whole food carbs at night. They help me sleep. Yes, they do. They are our body's appetite suppressant and antidepressant. Bananas, magnesium, and potassium. Okay. And what about napping? Wouldn't it be great to be able to simply lay down and fall asleep if you feel a little tired? Well, first of all, figure out why you're feeling tired, but some people just love a nap to reset. As Dr. Huberman says, that's fine, better 30 minutes, maybe 45, max an hour. But if it interferes with sleep at night, then the nap is not a great idea. Okay, staying calm. Let's talk about um, stress management. Don't worry, be happy. Your body will thank you for it. Sometimes easier said than done, but possible. Why am I looking at food? Well, we just heard that food can regulate our mood. And why are we looking at the gut? Because the microbiome is where 70 to 80% of our neurotransmitters, in other words, serotonin and dopamine and epinephrine, are produced. So if we have a gut flora, healthy gut flora, we looked at this last week, it enhances absorption of nutrients, it releases energy, and remember the word short chain fatty acids only come as metabolites of fiber. Fiber is the only thing that feeds the gut and short chain fatty acids are released, are released from that, protects against pathogen, helps promote healthy body weight, immune system, inflammation reduction, maintains integrity of the intestinal wall, and finally, supports brain function, which has everything to do with how we are able to handle stress. Anti-inflammatory foods, I won't even go over these, but look at them. They are a whole food plant-based diet. I'll remind you that Animal proteins, animal products are acidic. They create inflammation in the body, which is good. I mean, inflammation a little bit gets us stronger because it strengthens the immune system's response. But I'll go without that. Take my alkaline foods, which are great for you, and get the phytonutrients, phytochemicals, and polyphenols any day. Just reminding you, if you didn't see last week, that fabulous foods can come from a whole food plant-based lifestyle. That's my daily salad. It varies every day. Our crispy potatoes in the air fryer. This right here is Tim's entire salad, part of my chopped salad, because under that decoration up above is a chopped green combination. These are his avocado sandwiches and his fruit and his crudite, and that's a healthy lunch, and it's delicious. You don't have to give up the things you love, like tacos or stews. This is a South African peanut stew with sweet potato and lots of vegetables. This is a tofu scramble. Tofu, by the way, is fabulous for your brain and to help you relax and de-stress because of the proteins in it and the polyphenols in it. And those recipes, all of these recipes are on my website, nansimmonson.com. And is that a brownie? Yes. This brownie is made with sweet potatoes and dates. It's a whole food chocolate brownie. I believe it's the cherry chocolate brownie on my website. All right. Mindfulness and meditation. Do they matter? You now know that they matter a lot because what they do is they put the mind and therefore the body into a, they, they, they uh, I'll just say it affects our parasympathetic system, allows our fight or flight um, anxiety and, and body activity to stop long enough to allow our minds to become calm and our anxiety to um, de-stress to go into a rest and digest situation. What the benefits of um, meditation include brain empowerment and better focus, stress relief, 
Uh, we can reach goals better when we're thinking clearly. We can feel connected and balanced and centered and mood enhancement is the end result of that. Boost the immune system, anti-aging, healthy heart, and increase energy with meditation. This is my grandson who's now nine. He was five and he was already being taught that in school. Things that we do that we enjoy that sometimes seem, I was going to say hedonic, in other words, just for pleasure, can make a big difference in allowing us to de-stress, to get away from our physical world and do something as simple as getting a massage on a either regular or even an occasional basis, hands-on. The things that we can do have a lot to do with what we choose to focus on, like instead of anxiety, anger, and resentment, like right, gratitude. One of the things that is often recommended is journaling, and a gratitude journal makes sense. Why not write down three things in a day at the end of the day that you're grateful for, and maybe even elucidate with words like, oh my gosh, the sun was brilliantly warm, felt great on my skin. In other words, creating a mood as you write that um, allows you to anchor those thoughts and those feelings. Um, go to nature, vitamin N, nature. <laughs> That's what my mountain does for me. That's what riding my bike in the river bottom and then around the park where there are ducks and a lot of water does for me. But you can bring it into your home house plants, a lot of house plants even filter your air. What about in your own garden, gardening? As I said, I was a landscape designer for years and years. That was my nanscapes period for a couple of decades. The right side or the left side is in my front yard. And I can sit for a long time just watching the birds come and get their fresh water. On the right side, that's a little area in the back of my uh, house, we moved from, my late husband and I moved from a two and a quarter acre huge home, what we called our dream home, to a wonderful little cottage on 7,500 square feet. So this home is on 7,500 square feet. So this yard is tiny. And yet there are so many places to sit back in the back on a sunny, hot day. Under the shade cloth, you'll see the the structure is still on the right-hand side. This is where Tim and I eat in the winter where we want the sun, but we don't want it in our eyes. And we get to still watch the birds that go to the bird feeders around the backyard. We do that daily for lunch. He comes home for lunch almost every day because we don't want to eat out. And the foods that we get out aren't nourishing our bodies the way we like. What about just clouds and the sky and sunrise? This is the view east from my mountain. This is the view west from my mountain. That's a sunset. We can pick that up anywhere, regardless of where we live. Anytime Tim and I travel, we're out hiking. We love nature. Did you know that, and I think I mentioned this before, all of the microbiome of nature affects your microbiome, the things you smell, the things you walk in, the dirt that you shuffle up and the dust that you breathe in. You don't have to be anywhere away from where you live to take in, I'll call it nature, by just looking at organic elements and feeling the difference between the structure of something that's organic and what we think is important when our minds are worrying and we're looking at all the stuff we own and nothing is as real as, let's say, a few stones in front of us. <laughs> this guy has it right. He knows how to sleep. He knows how to exercise. Excuse me. He knows how to de-stress and he, he loves nature. Okay, what about love more? What does that mean? How do we do that? We can do it by calling and writing and being kind. 
connectedness. Social supports include family, friends, groups, networks, horizontal connectedness. In other words, what we do as we move through our lives. But how about a vertical connectedness to whatever we believe? I happen to believe in the universe <laughs> and the powers that be. Um, and prayer, whether it's meditation or prayer to a, a higher being, being present and living and feeling life at a basic level where we're not thinking ahead of where we are right now. Community, knowing that what we can offer can change lives. All of that is part of connectedness. We are tribal people. We don't have the option of going off on our own not and being healthy. We couldn't do that evolutionarily. And we don't do that very well right now, even though a lot of us think we can. COVID made a big difference in the way we view our world. And I think a lot of people now understand that. This is my son and his wife. They live in Palos Verdes, which is a peninsula, oh, about an hour and 15 minutes from my inland home. These boys were well, I don't know what their ages are, but I believe this was about three years ago. We as elders, if any of you are, I'm 72, can fill in for younger people in helping them raise their family while they do their busy lives, but it feeds us as well. The right tribe, we can surround ourselves. It's recommended that we surround ourselves with people that share our values and interests. And I know that that can become a challenge when we choose to prioritize our health in the ways that we do. It can sometimes be somewhat alienating. And yet, if we make a point to find people who cherish life and will do what it takes to be well, this is Judy Goodman. Judy is now 104 years old. This picture was taken when I was just beginning as a health coach. So she was 100 then. Now she's 104, almost 105. And this is Jane. Jane is someone you can see. She's up on the mountain who's 94. And she's gotten that way by walking every single day for miles. Doesn't matter your age. There are groups of people that you can find, even if you do it through meetup, even if you do it by joining a club, even if you do it by taking classes where you'll see people for a two to three month period and get to know them, connectedness makes us all happy. This is a group that I've known now for 40 years. I owned a Tupperware franchise when my son was four months old, went to a Tupperware party. Somebody talked me into selling, <laughs> selling, led me to management, management led me to my owning my own Tupperware franchise, which I did for 20 years. So I've known these people since Eric, who is now 45, was a baby, three, four months old. And every year, this lady right here, right in the middle, Sylvia Boyd, who's now 87, I think, has reunions. She lives a couple hours from me. Well, she lives in Pacific Palisades, a great place to be. If we weren't standing in the way, you'd be looking at the Pacific Ocean on the hill that she lives in. But the point is, these people, we go out of our way to see. Now, there are hundreds of them, and so we don't know who we're going to see at any given time. But the people that we see here light up our lives because we go out of our way to keep our connections going. Who can you keep your connections going with? It pays. It's a good thing. Guys and organizations understand that. We know it in church groups. But sometimes we need to go out of our way to find it, even when it seems that there's nobody looking at us, looking for our, I'll say, invitation. We can find ways to belong with others. I love this picture because I can't tell if the person is happy or sad or just picking up the phone thinking, oh my gosh, this isn't comfortable. I don't know what to say, but I think I'm going to do it. I recommend that because sometimes it just needs to be done when maybe it's a little inconvenient to say to a friend, I haven't seen you 
in months, most of us would text that. <laughs> Let's get together. Okay. Different movement practices can allow us to spend time with others. In other words, having things in common. As you know, I began running at 70, almost at 71, <laughs> a couple of 10Ks, and then I did a half marathon. I met a lot of people that way. And if you can't do it with people, find yourself a buddy and do it through a shelter where those poor animals need somebody to take them on and to love them. This is my sister-in-law. Isn't she pretty? She is 81 and um, takes great care of herself. Um, all right. Find a friend, find a partner, join a group, do it on your own, but take the time to rest, to de-stress, to get out in nature, to look at the sun in the mornings and pull it all together to give you a healthy, happier life. These are my grandsons. Oh, how many years ago is that? Five, six, six years ago, seven years ago, eight years ago. Anyway, and um, I cherish the time I had with them when they were younger because as they get older, the one on the left is now, I'm sorry, the one on the right is now 12. They are looking in other directions rather than <laughs> for their Nana to walk them down to the water. The Dalai Lama, when asked what surprised him about humanity, said, man, because he sacrifices his health in order to make money. Then he sacrifices money to recuperate his health. And then he's so anxious about the future that he doesn't enjoy the present. The result being, that he does not live in the present or the future. He lives as if he's never going to die. And then he dies having never really lived. We have to slow down. We have to take care of our senses. We have to do the things that make us healthy and strong and take us into the future. So making lifestyle shift, the rule and the exception to the rule, turn it on its head and make up some new rules. This isn't about perfection, it's about consistency of making wise health promoting choices, one bite at a time, one day at a time. And choices that we're referring to are alleviating stress, resting well, exercising regularly, investing in positive relationships, avoiding risky substances, lean into purpose and passion, shift to whole food, plant predominant dietary lifestyle, and it'll change your health destiny and your life. It's not about deprivation, it's about empowerment. Dream big, have the courage to do it, inspire others, and create harmony everywhere you go by being all inclusive. So last week, we talked about goal setting, or actually the first week. This is to remind you, to take some time now to think of what we've covered and apply SMART goals to it. What do you want to do as it relates to purpose, to movement, to food, to sleep, to de-stressing, to community? What do you want your life to look like in any one of those areas? Can you make a, a um, is there a way to measure them? An accountability, an accountability system is usually bringing others in with you or at least letting others know. I find that that really makes a difference. I make these announcements of what I'm going to learn to do and what I'm going to do. And then one way or another, I'll find a way to do it. Be realistic and make it achievable rather than beyond what makes sense. And include a timeline for completion. Go for it. We can't do it alone. I want to remind you that this is the program I did last year. And it's not a challenge now, but you can find this. Eat more plants, love more, sleep well, keep moving, stay calm, and be present on my YouTube channel. And they're short. They're like 20, 30-minute videos. And then if you go to, if you look at the left here, if you go to 
my nansimmonson.com website under resources, you'll find a write-up on each of those um, subjects. If you heard me last week, you know, as I wrote in Aging Powerfully, that the sunflower is my soul flower because it keeps its face to the sun and can grow in the most dire of circumstances. And I wish for you that kind of power to adopt an attitude that says anything is possible. This is the lady I'm going to be someday. <laughs> Nearing or over 100 and saying to the world, hey, I found a way to make this work. <laughs> Help me do that. In Aging Powerfully, I wrote, my mission for the next one, two to three decades is to pass on this word. And I'm doing it with you right now. <laughs>